So I want to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's webinar, our Living with SAD series. Tonight we have a two for one, AEDs in the home and subcutaneous ICDs. So I'd like to introduce our first presenter, which will be um, Adrian Olmos. Hold on just a moment. My dogs are barking like crazy. I don't think we'll go ahead. <laughs> anyway, Adrian uh, Olmos, for the last uh, three years, Adrian has been the director of patient advocacy for LifeShore. And LifeShore helps patients who've been prescribed an AED for home use due to a condition or an event that puts them at high risk for a sudden cardiac arrest. So I will turn it over to Adrian to begin. And I'd just like to ask everyone to kind of keep your um, audio muted while the presenters are going on and you can if you have your questions we'll have questions at the end and you can put your questions in the chat field and we will moderate those after adrian has completed his presentation so thank you all for being here welcome thank adrian. you thank you very much um welcome everybody uh again adrian with life sure um some of you maybe have used our services uh through your uh, doctor um and basically what we do, let me go to the next slide. Let's see. Next slide, there we go. Um, if you guys can see that. So at LifeSure, what we do is we, we advocate for the coverage of and delivery of AEDs. Uh, sometimes they're delivered to the hospital, sometimes they're delivered home, um, you know, in home environments. And uh, we work with a lot of different insurance companies, uh, sometimes different funding sources like foundations, uh, donations, things like that. Uh, and those are typically when we can't get it covered by insurance. Um, so we work with your physician, with your um, uh, prescriber, with your uh, nursing staff, your doctor's office, uh, to make sure you receive the best instructional care, which is by me, um, and also the best uh, AED uh, to assist you at home and you know, to be able to you know, kind of feel comfortable being away from a hospital if you need to get one uh, prior to discharge. Um, we work with plenty of uh, insurance companies now. We're still trying to get in network with a bunch more. Um, we're actively doing that every day, um, but that's you know kind of the gist of what we do. Uh, so if you can kind of see real quick, we've got a small team. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that, but uh, there's there's only four of us right now uh, on the immediate team. We do have some support from our parent company, One Beat Medical, uh, but these these are the the, the real you know. The real hard workers for for life sure. Uh, definitely the office team. Uh, Crystal, she's the uh, director of operations. Uh, Sherwood, she does their appeals, which is so important because, as many of you know, or if you don't know, if you've ever tried to get something covered by your insurance, sometimes they deny it, or oftentimes they deny it, and we have to go through the appeals process. That's why Sherwood is very valuable to us because she handles all that. Um, we also have Melissa. Uh, who handles uh, appeals, but also intake and getting authorization, sending the initial claim out. Uh, and then there's me, I'm the director of advocacy. Um, I work with the doctors, with the nurses, with the foundations uh, to answer questions, talk to families, talk to doctors, introduce our services, and try to help more, more people every day. And we are looking for somebody uh, in our Florida office. So if you know of anybody in the Miami area, we'd love to, we'd love to have more help. Um, so if you're familiar with SCA, with sudden cardiac arrest, you've probably seen this before, uh, the chance of survival from cardiac arrest. Um, as we know, uh, once uh, somebody goes into cardiac arrest, their chance of survival decreases every minute by about 10% or so. Um, the latest uh, stats from the American Heart Association uh, show that there's more than uh, 350,000 uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest annually, and nearly 90% of them are fatal. Uh, so that's why our mission is to get AEDs out to those at high risk for sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and that's why, you know, um, in the introduction you heard, it's typically because somebody has been uh, prescribed an AED uh, by their physician, by their cardiologist, that they need it for home use to have in the home to protect them against sudden cardiac arrest and to assist the family in, in and say and the rescue. Uh, so some of the conditions we see a lot, um, long QT, probably one of the 
most common one we see, I'd say 85 to 90% of our patients uh, have some form of long QT. Um, another one's Brugada syndrome. Uh, you see there CPVT, uh, Timothy syndrome, uh, Wolf Parkinson's white. Um, oftentimes when somebody already has an ICD, uh, but they have to have it um, uh, an explantation for whatever reason, infection or change out. Um, now they're no longer protected by their ICD, so now they're at risk. So a doctor may prescribe an AED for them to have uh, until they get another implantation. That's a reason to have a, uh, a prescribed home AED. Uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, ARVC, and then sometimes if the uh, implantation surgery is contraindicated, uh, due to the patient's condition, or maybe you know, the doctor and the patient uh, aren't ready for that yet, uh, they, may, we, they may prescribe an AED and we'll try to help them get it. Um, in the meantime, it's kind of a bridge. So those are just some of the reasons. We've also had other reasons to um, status post, um, heart transplant, things like that. Anything that's gonna put you at high risk for sudden cardiac arrest that the doctor feels you need an AED, that's typically when they'll write a prescription, letter of medical necessity and the rest. That we'll need. All right. uh, so what are our services? So what we do is we take that prescription from your doctor along with all the other supporting documentation, uh, get all that, send it off to your insurance and try to get your AD covered. Um, while that's going on, you know, you can call us for updates, things like that. Uh, then once your AD is approved, we offer AED training. Uh, sometimes people take us up on it, sometimes not. It's part of our service. It's, there's no extra charge for it. Uh, and if you do want it, um, we'll schedule like a Zoom call. And it'll typically be with me. Uh, and uh, we'll go over the functionality of the AED. Uh, we'll go through a scenario so I can, you can hear what it sounds like when you turn it on and some of the, um, the commands that it's gonna give you and then answer any questions. Um, you can also have other people on the call. I've had basketball coaches, I've had grandparents, caretakers, babysitters, teachers. Um, I think the most people I had on a call once was 10. Um, but you know, anybody that's in, involved in that uh, patient's care uh, can be on the call and ask questions and listen to the presentation. Uh, and then ongoing support. Um, this is something I end all my trainings with uh, is if you have a question you know, tomorrow, the next day, next year even, uh, you can always reach out to us for questions. Um, if you have questions about your AED, need extra supplies, um, or have another family member that maybe has a similar condition or the same condition that needs to get an AED by prescription, we can also help uh, their uh, care team uh, to funnel that through us, and then we can you know, work on getting that approved. Uh, let's see, and then there's some information, uh, our contact information, um, you can call our office, uh, or we have a website also, um, lifesureaed.com. Um, so that's uh, how you can get a hold of us, or if you, if you uh, reach out to the SADS Foundation, they can contact me directly, um, and they can give you my information, and you can reach out to me directly too for any questions you have, uh, or if you want me to talk to your physician, uh, your medical team, anything like that. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think we're opening that up to the chat. Um, I know I probably went through fast because I know sometimes questions kind of go over. So I wanted to kind of go through my presentation quick because sometimes the questions take a little longer, so. Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate that. And um, everyone can, you can either post your question in chat or if you would like to unmute yourself, you can raise your hand and, and unmute and ask your question verbally as well. We have a few people that are kind of joining in right now, joining late, coming in. Yeah, we've got a lot of time zones here, don't we? We do. We have four <laughs> time zones covered. Okay, Emily has raised her hand. Let's yes. see. I will. You can Hi. unmute. Go ahead, Emily. There you go. Hi. Um, do you have um, experience working with Kaiser Permanente Insurance? Because their we physicians are contracted, like they work for Kaiser, so it's a little bit different. Yeah, we do. And, and we're actually um, reaching out to them. Um, currently, we're still trying to get a contract with them uh, to be one of their in-network providers. But we have had some patients, uh, not a lot, but a few that have had Kaiser insurance um, and, they, you know, try to funnel it through us and we work the claim. Uh, I think we've got a few approved. Uh, sometimes they, um, they kick it back to Zoll because they think that 
Uh, Zoll Life Vest also has AEDs, but they don't. They just have the Life Vest. Uh, but when they see Zoll, they know, oh, they make AEDs. They must make, you know, Life Vest too. Uh, but they're two totally separate divisions. Um, Zoll Life Vest is one division, and then Zoll Company that manufactures AED, totally a separate business. So um, that's where confusion kind of comes in. Um, and so that's why we're, we're actually working with Zoll and some of the other manufacturers to get some of those leads that they get to um, help them get those AEDs out to those patients. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Of course. Um, do you have, so do you, is your experience that these AEDs only get approved if the patient has had an event? So for example, my, my daughter and I have long QT, but we haven't had what they consider an event. We haven't had a, a fainting or an arrest, a cardiac arrest. Um, so no. No, it, you don't have to have an event. Um, we do have some patients that are status post, you know, cardiac arrest, but a lot of the times there's no event um, there, but they're still at risk because they carry that gene. Um, okay. And that's what, if the doctor feels you're still at risk just because you have that gene, then by all means, and we've gotten AEDs covered for that reason, uh, just as a precaution, you know, just as kind of a, um, I, they call it like secondary um, mm -hmm. protection or something like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Karen. Do you use only certain manufacturers of AEDs? And that why? is a great question. That's a great question. And <laughs> thanks to this pandemic, we've kind of uh, had to address that because since there's been a supply shortage globally, uh, and a lot of the manufacturers we work with uh, work on a global scale, um, that's kind of had to open uh, up the doors to using other manufacturers. So in the past, we were primarily using one provider or manufacturer, uh, and we've had to kind of open that up because of um, some of those manufacturers aren't able to keep up with demand uh, or because they're not able to get AEDs out uh, because they're waiting for um, certain, you know, little chips, micro, um, processing chips, things like that, whatever it, you know, there's something always holding up production. Uh, so we've had to use, kind of open it up to all manufacturers to get those uh, AEDs provided. And actually I was talking to a, a mom today and I was talking about a patient that we helped um, get an AED just the other day. Uh, I think today the family was gonna go pick her up and I did the training for the family last night. Uh, she's just getting discharged from the NICU. Uh, if we didn't open that up to other manufacturers, we wouldn't be able to service her till next year. And that's just, that that can't be. We have to get those AEDs out to patients now because a lot of times it's pending discharge. Uh, and we've, we've, so we had to kind of scramble and uh, kind of use our other um, resources with other manufacturers to get AEDs in so we can service our patients. Okay, thank you. Continuing on, do you have AEDs for infants? Sure. So the infant, uh, they call it infant pediatric pack or um, pads, um, typically is what is used for infants. Um, that's kind of the smallest um, pad pack or a, uh, electro pads that they make. Uh, sometimes they're, I think they, you know, infant uh, z uh, zero to one and then uh, child is considered one to eight. Uh, and so that's what those uh, infant uh, child electrodes are for. Um, it's for the, that patient population. Uh, and then anybody over the age of eight or over 55 pounds can use uh, adult electrodes. Um, so yeah, so there really isn't an AED for infants or adults. It really has to do with the electrodes that turn the AED into uh, an AED suitable for a pediatric infant or an adult. Oops, I think you're, I think you're muted. Button didn't work. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, Alexis has a question here. Uh, we have a Philips Heart Start yes. and have been unable to source replacement AED pads in Canada for many months due to the shortage. Yeah. Uh, any advice for families in these situations? Yeah, so uh, in Canada, um, I, I think they're starting to ramp up production uh, to get those supplies out. I know that there's been a back order for some time. Uh, our parent company, OneBeat, I believe they're getting um, pads and batteries in. Uh, so if you want to go to onebeatmedical.com, you may be able to order those. I don't know how it works ordering out of the country, but I think because we're pretty close, I think it's okay. But I'm 
that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of a one B question. Uh, but I believe they've got some supplies either coming in um, and definitely filling back orders. Um, I think soon. So uh, you can check that website and see if we can um, if they can service service you for those those pads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so one beat is your parent company, correct? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, can you get an AED for each member of a family or one per family? That's a great question. I, I get that a lot too. So it really is one per patient that has the qualifying uh, diagnosis to be prescribed an AED. Um, we've serviced a lot of families that have multiple children and or family members that have either the same condition or the same gene. Uh, because especially now that you know everything's opening up again, you may have one child at basketball practice, one at dance, one at cheer, one at uh, football practice. They're not always in the same place like they were during the pandemic. So now that they're all kind of going their separate ways, you know, throughout the day, they definitely need to have their own. And it really kind of goes. It's really meant for each patient um, when they're you know to be with them at all times. That's typically what the uh, the physician will write on the prescription. Um, so it really is one per patient, per, per qualifying patient, I'd say, um, that has a, a need for it or is at risk for sudden cardiac arrest. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Adrian? We've had some good ones here. Yeah, those are great questions and, and things that questions that we get a lot. So. Luckily, I'm able to answer those fast. And, and one person asked, and I wasn't sure what are the steps to do something, and I wasn't sure what steps to do what. I wasn't sure what that question was related to. You want to raise your hand, you can unmute yourself and ask. Okay, maybe this is the same one here. Should I ask my EP to write a prescription and send it directly to you or try? That's okay, that might have been that's it. it. Yeah, that's so, it. okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so... With Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal, um, this one's kind of a special insurance. So often in times we have to have the patient uh, or the family member uh, request the, um, make the request to the insurance company because we can do it. So we're considered out of network with them. And because they are nationwide and they kind of go state by state, it's kind of hard to know where, you know, those prescriptions are going to come into. So where we can get in network. Um, so a lot of times we have to, but we've able to been, uh, we're able to secure ADs for, for patients that have this insurance. Um, we have to have the family's help in getting um, the insurance company to process the claim. Uh, so, and we can walk you through the steps of that because we actually have a, a mom that really took the bull by the horns and went, um, and went to bat and, and really helped get the AD covered um, for, her, uh, for her son. So we can definitely help with that. Excellent, all right. And does Medicare cover it? Yes, so, um, this, so the code we use is uh, created by uh, CMS. So CMS is the Center for Medicaid, for Medicare and Medicaid um, centers. That's what uh, kind of governs uh, what we're called a DME. Uh, durable medical equipment companies. Um, that's where you know, we have to have our licensing and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, Medicare does cover them, um, just like they cover a lot of, uh, of other devices, um, like vest, things like that. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions for Adrian and LifeSure? We appreciate your time and volunteering tonight, Adrian, and sharing all this information. Of course, I think it really does help our families. Sure. And if you guys have any questions and you didn't you know, answer or, or ask tonight, you can always uh, shoot them to SADS or, or contact me directly uh, or go to our website. Our, at, our email for SADS would be sads at sads.org. Very easy. All right. Okay. I don't see any others right now in the chat or any hands raised. So let's, uh, so I thank you, Adrian. And we'll move on to our, our second topic for the evening, which would be subcutaneous ICDs, another option. Okay. And let me introduce our presenter for that. Um, it's gonna be Sharon Goldman. Uh, Sharon has been with Boston Scientific for close to 20 years. 
as the clinical advisor for both traditional transvenous ICDs as well as subcutaneous or SICD. Sharon develops educational programs for both patients and physicians related to heart failure and sudden cardiac death. She has been a, she has a healthcare background and also a personal interest in minimally invasive technology that improves the quality of life for people with medical conditions such as ours that increase their risk. Um, and let's see, she joined, she's joined tonight by two colleagues, Stephen Donnelly of Boston Scientific's Tech Services, as well as Kurt Johnson to help answer some of the technical questions about the devices from Boston Scientific. So thank you, Sharon, for being here. And I'll let you uh, go ahead and begin. Great, thank you, Marsha. And I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, I, uh, the personal interest is my father actually had heart failure. And I can tell you, um, it was right at the beginning when defibrillators and heart failure devices were in trials. And, um, you know, the, the sad thing is, is we were seeing a cardiologist and I wasn't working at Boston at that time, but we were never told about the option of a defibrillator for my father or a heart failure, a, a biventricular device. So it's been a passion of mine to make sure that, um, you know, patients and their family members are aware of all of the options. And so when Marsha and her colleagues asked us to talk about SICD, another option, for patients, we were really excited. So um, I, I wanted to also share with you that Boston Scientific, our headquarters are in Boston, but we our, pri our primary offices are in uh, the St. Paul area in Minnesota. And we, um, we uh, you know, it's, um, it's, we make both the subcutaneous and transvenous ICDs. And the subcutaneous ICD has been around for about 10 years now here in the US. Uh, and so um, it's been used in over 100,000 patients worldwide, but you may not be aware of it. So what Marcia asked us to, you know, uh, you know, some of you may be very aware of it, but I, I, we, uh, this presentation, I made it somewhat basic. So if it's too basic for some of you, I apologize, but I wanted to make sure that if people weren't familiar with our devices, I covered that. So I'm going to jump in here. And first of all, this question I get a lot is, you know, why, why do I need a defibrillator? And Adrian uh, already kind of went through this, is that if you have a sudden cardiac arrest outside of the hospital, your chance of survival is only one out of 10. Um, and uh, if you do have a defibrillator, your chance of survival is over 95%. And in the case of uh, you know, ICD or SICD devices, it's actually closer to 98 or 99%. So uh, that's why they're recommending these devices. If you are either have had a sudden cardiac arrest or uh, if, as Adria mentioned, if you have a risk factor, a genetic condition, for example, um, you, your doctor is going to recommend a, a, an ICD or an SICD. So first of all, why don't we talk about the two options here? And I've got a, a, a cartoon picture here. And on the left-hand side, you're seeing the traditional transvenous ICD system where, and, and it's really two components. You've got the, the um, what we call the generator or the CAN, the pulse generator, which is really, you can think of it as the brains, the computer. And then you have a wire or an electrode that goes inside of your heart. Um, and those two components are essential in order for this to work properly. Um, with uh, SICD or subcutaneous ICD, the location of this pulse generator or can is different. It's placed uh, underneath your left arm and, it, and many physicians today are actually putting it into a natural pocket in between your two muscle groups, your latissimus dorsi and your serratus. And then the electrode is actually tunneled underneath your left breast and then up the sternum. Um, you'll see it a, a few minutes. I'll show you some pictures that have uh, patients who actually have these devices. This is all inside. You're not going to be seeing it. But I wanted to show you kind of what that looks like uh, on the inside view. And both of these devices are shown to be highly effective in preventing 
death if you have a sudden cardiac arrest. And they monitor your heart 24-7. Um, I've had patients tell me they feel like they've got a paramedic with them at all times. They feel very safe you know, now that they have a device, especially if they've had a sudden cardiac arrest. And the way these devices work is they're monitoring your heart 24-7, and they're looking for life-threatening arrhythmias. And in which case, if that happens, um, it will deliver a shock, uh, similar to what you see on TV with the external paddles, but this is all inside. And the shock will actually convert your heart back to a normal sinus rhythm. And there is another therapy um, available today in transvenous ICDs called, we call it for short, ATP, um, which stands for anti-tachycardia pacing. And what that is, is just really rapid pacing that interrupts that abnormal arrhythmia, and in about half of the time, it can um, convert you back to normal sinus rhythm. We don't currently have anti-tachycardia pacing available in the SICD today. We do have trials underway, though, to be able to provide that in the future. So I'm going to move on here, and one of the other questions is, will an ICD prolong my life? And the answer is, is yes, that's what the studies show in terms of um, preventing sudden cardiac death. Um, this, these are studies that were done like 20 years ago. Um, the SICD has had to repeat these types of studies to show that it can successfully save your life should you go into a sudden cardiac arrest. And in those early studies, um, a third of the patients actually lived longer if they had an ICD versus people who had the same conditions, but did not have a, an ICD. They were just being medically managed. And that those pivotal studies back in the early 2000s are what got these devices actually approved by the FDA um, to be used in patients such as yourself. So this is really landmark. Um, we're so fortunate to have these devices today. They haven't been around all that long, you know, if you think about it, but you know, today, um, we have something to protect you. And um, we have a picture of a seatbelt here because that's how I like to think about it. It's, you know, hopefully you're never going to need to use this device, you know, but if you do need it, if you have a, a, a sudden cardiac arrest, it is there to protect you. It's like a life insurance policy or like a seatbelt. So let's talk about the similarities and differences between the subcutaneous and transvenous ICD. I've already gone through, um, here are some cartoon images to show you that the biggest, probably the main difference is the location of that pulse generator and most importantly, the location of the electrode or the lead. In the case of the subcutaneous ICD, it is no, not inside of your heart, whereas in the case of a transvenous, it is inside of your heart. And the reason the subcutaneous device was developed is because people are living a lot longer with these devices and uh, physicians and patients wanted to have an option available where the wire was not inside of your heart. Because over time, the, the, um, we know that over time, the pulse generator, you're gonna need a, a, what we call a battery replacement. Um, and I'll show you kind of the length of time on the, those in a minute. But we were finding that sometimes these electrodes or wires from the transvenous device were also having to be replaced. And it, it's, much more, it's much easier to take and replace an electrode if it's not inside of your heart. Okay, so let's go into some other common differences here or similarities. Battery life. So the um, Boston Scientific, we have... Um, just um, we make all of our batteries here on uh, on campus in St. Paul. We have a state of the art, amazing battery manufacturing facility, and we are actually the company that came out with the longer lasting transvenous batteries. Um, gosh, it's, it's like eight or nine years ago now, almost ten. But um, they didn't used to last this long, twelve years, in some cases even a little more. But they are today, which is is amazing work by our battery engineers. And when the SICD first came out, it was only lasting about five years. 
And now um, what we're seeing with our newer generation devices is they're lasting um, in up, uh, with what the data is showing is about 8.7 years they're projected to last. So we're, we're still not as good as transvenous ICDs on the SICD front, but we're better than we were when, they, when, when this product first came out. So that's something to consider though. If, if um, battery changeouts are not something you want, you should talk to your doctor about that. Will I have a scar? Um, you know, I think surgeon, you know, the surgical skills of our physicians have gotten so much better, but um, the fact of the matter is you're gonna have a little scar. And I myself, I've got two knee replacements and a hip replacement. So I have kind of matching scars, but you know, uh, one of the things that we see um, is that everybody is different in terms of how um, their body heals. So for some patients, they scar really easily. For other patients, you can barely see it. This woman over here on the left, I'm showing you, she has a transvenous ICD gen, and you can see that her, uh, her device, you can barely see her scar. Um, whereas with other people, it's gonna be more noticeable. And the other thing about the um, transvenous ICD, you can see body habitus is super important, right? You know, for some patients like, again, Jan here, or the physician um, where he put the can, I think in her case, he put it under her breast, um, but you cannot see it at all. I mean, you really can't see it. But with Dennis up here, there is a little bump. So, you know, we don't want people to be surprised when they get their defibrillator that, you know, it's going to, it is going to show a little bit, you know, so um, be aware of that. And the other thing, I encourage you to ask your doctor, many, many um, implanters will actually keep patient, pictures of their patients. They're kind of proud of them. So um, ask them, ask those questions. On the SICD side here, you can see Todd, who has an SICD. From the front, you can see, you know, having it under the arm is nice. Some people really like that because you're not, it's, it's not as visible. Um, we typically walk, don't walk around with our arms up, have them down. Um, you, his scar is more noticeable here. And that's because this one, uh, when he came in for this photo shoot, I think he'd, it was only like three or four weeks old. Um, and then here we have Jan and you can see, um, you know, her scar is much more healed. So uh, important. Okay, and then I'm gonna move on to pacing. Pacing, whether it's anti-tachycardia pacing or uh, pacing like you get from a pacemaker for a slow heart rate, Brady, we call it Brady pacing. Um, we currently cannot do that with the SICD device. That's just not a capability it has today. Whereas with the transvenous ICD, you do get anti-tachycardia pacing and it can also provide pacemaker functions if you need it. Um, as I mentioned, we have studies underway to be able to do this in the future with the SICD, but we do not have it today. So that's something your doctor is going to consider and may talk to you about. Um, and then screening. Um, so with the subcutaneous ICD, you'll notice that there's a yes here in the box. You do need to go through if, um, a really simple test. You won't feel it. It's, it's, it lasts like 15 minutes, but we're doing an EKG screening to make sure that, um, that, you, that your uh, EKG is appropriate for an SICD. Um, and about 90% of people, 85 to 90%, depending on the diagnosis, um, screen in. So I wanted to mention that as well. Okay, so moving on here. Um, do we have, does Boston Scientific provide any patient resources? The, Yes, we absolutely do. And um, I'm gonna skip back here. We, um, what you're seeing here on the slide is um, we have a website that was originally designed for the subcutaneous ICD. When it came out, healthcare providers wanted something to share with their patients. We have now started adding some more transvenous content in here, like I just showed with you. The slides I just went through, the brochure is right here out on the website. Um, we also have um, a 1-800 number for patients and families to call with questions. And then probably the most popular thing is we collect stories from patients. They tell their, their story, which is really cool. And many people, many patients tell me they love watching those because, you know, you feel like you're 
um, you're hearing right directly from a patient. So right now we have two um, SICD patient stories from Todd and Jan, and then we have a transvenous ICD patient story from, from Deb. So it's really kind of fun to, to see those. And then last uh, thing I wanted to show you is that we also have a find a doctor, and this is for subcutaneous ICD. Not every physician, every implanter is implanting the SICD. So if um, you know if if you if your cardiologist needs to find one in your area, this is a resource that's available. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to show you here is um, we do have a short. Uh, a uh, little video that shows shows kind of the uh, the implant technique for the for the SICD, and so I'm going to stop sharing for a sec and go to a, a different uh, screen. So bear with me a second, and I'll play. And, I'll, and I also need to do sound. So bear with me a second. And here we go. Rest. When you're talking to your doctor about a defibrillator, you'll probably discuss two types, the traditional ICD and the newer SICD. Both devices monitor your heart rhythm 24 hours a day, and both are available from Boston Scientific. They are both effective in providing an electrical shock if they detect a life-threatening heart rhythm. Let's look at the options. A traditional ICD or transvenous ICD is typically implanted in the left shoulder area near your collarbone. It requires one or two wires called leads to be placed in the heart through your veins. An SICD or subcutaneous ICD is typically implanted by your lower left ribs just under your arm. Unlike traditional ICD, the SICD is placed just under the skin with no wires touching the heart. You are probably wondering what the procedure to implant a device is like. Let's look at an implant for an SICD. The procedure involves six steps. First, your doctor will make an incision on the left side of your chest, next to your rib cage. Then, the doctor will form a pocket or pouch under your skin. That's where the SICD device will be inserted. Next, the doctor will make small incisions so the electrode can be placed under your skin. The electrode is then attached to the SICD device. Once the SICD has been implanted, most doctors will induce an arrhythmia or irregular heartbeat to test the device. That's so the SICD can detect and stop an abnormal heart rhythm automatically. Some settings may be adjusted to work best for your heart using a separate program or tablet. Finally, your doctor will close the incisions. Inserting the device itself takes about one hour. However, the entire procedure takes longer. After an SICD implant, you should be able to continue doing the things you love, such as golfing, gardening, and playing with grandkids. Ask your doctor about any activity restrictions the two devices, traditional ICD and SICD, would require. There's a lot to consider as you think about devices to protect against sudden cardiac arrest, and you surely have a lot of questions. Talk to your doctor, and together, you can explore if this device is right for you. You can also learn more at SICDSystem.com. Okay. Well, hopefully, um, you were all able to hear that. And I can see we have a lot of questions in the chat. And if it's okay with you, Marsha, I'm going to... I'm so glad I have my colleagues. My my, I, I should introduce both um, Stephen and uh, Kurt are really our experts who got like the cream of the crop tonight in terms of answering all of these more technical questions. And so I think what I'm going to start with is um, somebody asked, are there any studies underway for subcutaneous pacemakers? And um, yes, the answer is yes. We have um, a study that actually just started this year to, uh, you know, in order to get FDA approval for, for the pacemaker that can provide both antitachycardia pacing and Brady pacing. So great question. Um, you know, 
like many medical device companies, we're always innovating and, and there's just really cool new stuff coming, in, uh, coming out. And this is a pacemaker that is about the size of a AAA battery. It's very tiny um, and uh, actually uh, would go in, inside of your right ventricle and um, it can communicate directly with the subcutaneous ICD. And so the uh, SICD would tell it whether it needs ATP or Brady pacing. Um, but our philosophy is um, very few patients end up needing that. Um, and so we only wanna provide the therapy you, you need when you do need it. So um, that will be up to your physician to decide along with you. Okay, and um, there's a few questions here. Um, let's see, okay. How big Karen, is that? there was one early on that was about addressing um, the current recall on premature battery depletions in the SICD. I've heard address that, but before I thought I would take the ones I could ask first. And so um, go right ahead. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is somebody asked how big the um, SICD is, and I actually have a, a generator here. It is bigger than your traditional transvenous ICD. Um, but what I want to tell people is that the location, um, I actually, when I, when I started working with the SICD, because I was working with our transvenous ICDs, I actually um, uh, actually put this in my bra and, and wore it around for a few days just so I could feel, because it's in a different place. And what we hear from patients, the other thing is that many physicians now are putting it in between two muscle groups, your latissimus, dorsi, and the serratus. And it's much more um, secure and comfortable there. Um, once you get used to it, it, people don't complain about the size. So because of the location, the size is better. Um, if we, you know, the reason for the size being bigger, I'm not sure if you know why, is because you don't have that wire inside of your heart, your, um, the defibrillator needs about twice the amount of energy in order to put you, take you out of that arrhythmia and into normal sinus rhythm. So that's why it's bigger. All right, so I am gonna um, turn this over to, let's start at the top here. Somebody um, would like to talk about the advisory and um, Kurt, I'm gonna shoot it over to you. Yeah, thanks Sharon. So um, as Sharon shared, you know, Boston Scientific is always innovating, but the, the other thing we do is we're routinely and vigilantly monitoring the um, performance of our products. And so if we see that there's a, you know, a material elevation in patient safety risk, or we can, you know, make recommendations to improve patient outcomes, then we'll, we'll send out an advisory letter. So um, thanks Sherry for the question. Uh, with respect to um, the premature depletion advisory that we sent out, her question was whether, whether we, uh, what we've done about it. So just as some background, um, there's a potential for, you know, certain devices to exhibit premature depletion. There's a spectrum of premature depletion. In some cases, um, it can be very sudden. In this case, though, it's a, very, um, uh, it's a very moderate rate of depletion. And so you've got a lot of time uh, for the device to detect and for your doctor to, um, to take action before the device is completely depleted. Um, the, uh, what occurred back, actually back in, in August 2018 is we were you know, using a component to, uh, to make, the, make the device one of the electrical components. And we identified an opportunity to, to go to a different supplier that uh, we felt was gonna be more robust. And so we made that transition uh, in August 2018. And, and that actually preceded our formal investigation of this, of this, this pattern or trend. Um, and then subsequently in that, in that investigation, we identified that, um, that the original component had this susceptibility. And so, um, and so for those devices that are manufactured after um, kind of that August 2008 timeframe, they're really not gonna be susceptible to this. With respect to what we've done about it is, um, uh, you know, we've, <clears throat> we've added some, uh, a detector inside our devices. And so that was some software that we released um, earlier this year. And so it's designed to be able to identify and detect that rather than our doctors having to kind of notice that there's a change in, in battery depletion. And it'll initiate uh, either uh, beeping tones or um, an, an, an alert condition through our, our latitude patient management system to let the doctors know that something's going on. But again, as I shared before, 
the rate of depletion is moderate. And so um, it's very common for people to have uh, many, many months or years um, time to be able to detect and, and, um, um, and, and replace the device before it's actually fully depleted. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I, I'm wondering if maybe you could tackle this next question. I had an MRI with the emblem device and lost the alert tones. It concerns me that the alert tones are gone when my mm. device is under a recall for premature battery depletion. Why did they disappear and is there a way to get them back? Yeah, so the, um, the kind of the onset of doing MRIs with devices sort of came on um, before we, uh, so, so when, we when the original SICD was designed, it used basically a, a kind of beeper that, that magnetic fields can, can, um, can compromise. And so there was kind of this, you know, this challenge, you know, do we um, facilitate, you know, MRI use and, you know, have compromised beeper or do we just not, you know, facilitate MRI use? But the, the amount of, uh, in the, in the, and the desire to use MRIs, you know, for various conditions was really, really high. So what we've kind of done as our first step is that we've, you know, created a device that has the ability to, to be conditional, uh, conditional use MRI, which means they put it in certain settings to make sure that it's safe for the patient to get an MRI. But one of the outcomes of that is because of the beeper technology that we currently have, um, those magnetic fields can kind of mess up the beeper about 50% of the time. Um, as we were talking about the previous you know, topic, which is premature depletion, um, uh, one of the very, you know, also big trend inside the United States has been the use of remote patient management, which for us is the latitude patient uh, management system, which is a communicator that kind of sits by your bedside that you'd interact with, you know, maybe once a week, once a month, based on your doctors, how your doctor has it set up. And, um, and that can detect if there's any kind of problematic conditions if you have a situation where your where your beeper isn't isn't going to be working, and then furthermore, um, as you go in and you see your physician, obviously they're going to be able to take a look at the device and, and check things out. So um, so yeah, unfortunately there isn't a way in any particular device to kind of resurrect the beeper, and we are working on you know our next generation device. Right, we can't necessarily go in and and open up the device that's already been implanted and been manufactured and and fix that. But we are looking at technologies in our Next generation devices that wouldn't uh, that would be able to sustain uh, its beeping tones through the MRI uh, an MRI procedure or MRI scan. Thank you, Kurt. All right, here's another question. I um, well, it's a comment. I've had my SACD for just over five years. At my last interrogation, I was told I still have ten plus years left, despite being shocked twelve times in the last four years. Well. I don't know if, uh, if uh, Kurt, you want to tackle that one or Steve? I mean, it's, it's sure, more- I'll pass that one to Steve. Sure, thanks, uh, Kurt, Sharon. Yeah, indeed, uh, you know, this is a scenario where, um, you know, the, the initial metrics that are being presented there perhaps seem a little more on the optimistic side, but we, we clearly do have a technical support staff available here at Boston Scientific. So I would in, encourage the patient that if, if you, um, have questions about uh, this this uh, estimate that's being provided. Certainly, um, either the clinician or the Boston Scientific reps can reach out to us specifically. We can look at diagnostic uh, data on the device in a real detailed manner and, and come back with a customized observation and uh, in longevity estimate, if you will. So I'd encourage you to get in touch with your um, clinician to uh, have that reviewed if you have a question about that. I didn't really have a question. I was just making a statement that supporting your battery life uh, comment that you have good battery life. And that's what I've heard. And that's what is that I've seen so far with not my device. Yeah, yeah very good, Jeff. Yeah, and it, it's encouraging uh, to see that, you know, admittedly, the, you know, the, the 10 plus years part is a little more on the intriguing side, we might say, but uh, uh, that said, you know, clearly, as, as Sharon illustrated earlier in that presentation, your expectation here is, uh, you know, 8.x uh, years is where we're, where we're tr uh, shooting for and having five already, uh, um, feel free to give us a shout and be happy to provide you with a detailed estimate. I guess I'll interject as an industry, we publish our, um, our cumulative survival um, of our products, both our leads and our pulse generators and product performance reports. 
And so, um, you know, Boston Scientific publishes that and you can see over time how a given product has, has kind of done um, longitudinally based on kind of the accumulation of the surveillance that we're doing on our products, uh, you know, longitudinally. So. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Steve. Um, another one here. Um, my name is Summer. I had a Boston Sci implanted on June 3rd after a sudden cardiac arrest. I still haven't received my home monitor and I keep getting told it's on back order. Um, so uh, Steve or Kurt? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things, so um, I'll, yeah, I'll take that one. So the, the latitude patient management system is, you know, has some electronic components that are, that are inside of it. And, um, and there are some of those components that are, that are, you know, experiencing a global, you know, supply chain shortage. So the good news is we're, we're able to make them again, but we're kind of, you know, as we're ramping up production, trying to chew through, through the back orders. And uh, so we'll, it'll get out there, but you know, the challenge is, is that, there was an interval of time uh, for those that might remember. There was a, a long shutdown that occurred earlier this spring in China, and then some other uh, global supply chain challenges that, you know, have affected the, the remote patient management system. So we're working as diligently as we can to um, to get those out. But uh, I apologize, Summer, for your your having to wait on that. Thank you, Kurt. I'll take these next two. Um, so. Would SACD be better for young children, um, newborn until age five or six with Timothy syndrome, considering that little ones grow and sometimes have issues with regular ICDs? So this is a great question to ask your, your, your cardiologist, your pediatric health. I mean, I can tell you that the SACD is implanted in, um, in, in people under the age of 18. I, in terms of a newborn, um, this one would be, you know, this would be a great question for your physician. So, um, but I can tell you there are, a, you know, a, a number of pediatricians or pediatric cardiologists who uh, are implanting interventional cardiologists that are implanting these devices in children, but great question. On the next one here, are SADS condition patients usually good candidates for the SICD and who tends not to be? I think I'll tackle the who tends not to be. Again, this would be similar to um, you know, pediatrics or children or young <clears throat> adults. Um, we have many young adults with, it, with all of these conditions that have an SICD. Um, who tends not to be? If you are a patient who needs uh, bradycardia pacing, or who could benefit from anti-tachycardia pacing. Those people are usually um, a transvenous ICD, but it's really trade-offs, right? Okay, so let's say you're really young, you know, and that's why you really need to have this conversation with your physician. Um, we call it shared decision-making, which is a new requirement here in the US for any patient getting a SICD. Your physician should be talking with your, um, you and your family about the options. And, if, if an SACD is an option for you, you got to ask questions and find out. It's, it's got to be a joint decision. Um, so um, the other uh, type of patient who would not be eligible is, I, I talked a little bit about SACD screening. If you screen out, if you're not, that, that's going to make you not eligible for an SACD. Okay. Um, is it appropriate for Timothy syndrome? Can it distinguish two to one block or T wave alternates? Is there a size requirement? Does the placement change as the child grows? Can it be used post infection? Okay, so um, I'm going to tackle the infection one first. Um, you know, and again, this is um, you really need to have this conversation with your physician because it looks like you've got. You're mentioning some some pacing needs here in terms of being able to have backup pacing, um, and so that's really. And I'm not an expert on uh, syndrome, but your physician is, so they'd be the best person to address those hmm. types of questions. Um, post infection, um, the SICD has been implanted in a number of people who have developed a transvenous ICD infection. Um, and 
you know, again, it's going to be up to your implanter, you know, that, you know, um, at what point in time they're going to implant that. Do they want you to wear a life vest for a period of time? Um, and does lead placement change as a child grows? This is one I'm, again, I'm not an expert on this particular question, but I would, um, this would be one for your physician. I'm assuming it does, um, but probably is being, you know, it, it might be less um, of a challenge um, than a, a transvenous lead. Okay. Um, okay, this is Jeff again. I had an option turned, I had an option turned on about 16 months ago. This option is supposed to notify me eight to 10 seconds in advance of a shot. Ooh. I'm excited to have this option turned on, but no one has been able to tell me what the sound is or sounds like. Can you help me with this? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a situation where you can, um, and it's, it's something that I haven't, that, that wasn't very popular. And so uh, I have to look and make sure our contemporary devices still have it, but it's essentially a beep on charge. And so the device uh, kind of creates a warbling sound when it's uh, beginning to uh, uh, charge up to deliver a shock. It can um, be disconcerting to people those. It can be difficult to uh, distinguish that beeping from other beeping things that can occur. And um, um, so um, I have to, I can look here in the manual real quick to see if that's still in our contemporary devices, but um, it, it just isn't uh, something that people generally um, want. But so if you give me a minute, I can respond in the chat. That one. All right, going to the, I've heard that Boston Scientific transvenous ICDs can be programmed to notify a patient when they are charging to shock. When I asked my cardiologist about it, <clears throat> and just inclined to investigate. Is that true? Does it depend on which device you have? Yeah, this is the same beeping one I'm kind of covering. It. I feel like it's two different. Jump in here if you uh, if, if, uh, you have more intel. Yeah, I will. Okay, I'm coming, going down. At what percent do you need to have your battery changed? Well, um, and Steve, you... You can go ahead and take this one, but I there's an early replacement indicator that mm -hmm. uh, your your uh, clinicians will notify you if once you hit that point. And how much time, Steve, does that provide? Yeah, certainly. So we have uh, uh, up to six shocks. We've got uh, um, 60 days, and and with that consideration. Um, the note here is that on, on the reporting, what you'll see is that we'll go down to uh, 1%, if you will, and then it will uh, set ERI, if you will. So ERI is somewhat equivalent to, to a zero mark, if you will. Um, and it's at that point in time that the clinician would uh, look to get the replacement scheduled and uh, battery changed. Um, but there is still therapy available um, with the device when it hits that you know, 1% zero mark, if you will, the ERI point. Well, we've got about 60 days. Once you hit ERI, you're still going to be able to get all the therapy. And you've got two months to get that uh, change out uh, schedule. Okay. Hey, I'm jumping back in. Yeah, so that, that is available. It's called beep during capacitor charge. And, um, um, but it would do that potentially if there was, um, when the, the, so the device can initiate charging when it, detects an arrhythmia and wants to deliver therapy. It also performs periodic charging as part of the maintenance of the, of the battery and the capacitors. And so um, uh, the challenge is, is that it, it doesn't discern whether um, it's gonna deliver, it's doing charging for delivering a shock or delivering kind of doing the maintenance. And so that's, I think, why it's been sort of unpopular because um, you know, you don't necessarily know whether that particular charge is going to result in a shock or not until after it gets to the end, and that causes, you know, some anxiety and concern for folks. Um, but for our defibrillators, our transvenous ICDs, that's that's available. It's not something you'd obviously have for pacing, and not something for the SICD. 
Okay. For me, it almost causes more anxiety not knowing what the sound is because I could hear, I hear any sound anywhere, you know, any beep or, and I, and I count to 10 because I wonder if it's my device charging sometimes. Mm, sure. Um, yeah. So I'd well, be nice to know if there was a way, you know, you put a sound file on your website and you could click on it and go, ah, oh, that's what that sounds sure. like or. Yeah, we, yeah, I mean, that's a good suggestion. We don't, we don't have something like that. What you, uh, you know, what you could do is next time you go in and see your clinician, you could ask them um, for that. And there'd be a way that they could kind of demonstrate that sound in the, in the clinic for you if you wanted it, but it's, it's not only off. So unless they've turned it on, it's not gonna, it's not going to beep when it's charging. Yeah. It's been specifically turned on for me. Um, okay. It wasn't yeah. mentioned that there was any other time that it could possibly go off and so you're saying it could go off the device sometimes like will charge for no particular reason or or, or well it, it, there's there a is reason, a reason I mean, yeah yep it it so what happens is you can imagine in a in a in a system some patients you know require shocks periodically and some some you know some patients won't require shocks over the life of their device um, so as a safety feature, the system periodically will will charge up like it's going to deliver a shock. It won't deliver a shock, but um, and what that does is that exercises the batteries, the capacitors. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can imagine if you had a system that was a battery and you never, you know, and that, that was in a device that lasted seven, eight, nine, ten years and and never operated. That uh, you know you'd want some. So so just from a maintenance standpoint of the batteries yeah. and the high voltage capacitors. We, uh, I mean, we charge periodically. Is it loud enough that, it would, I mean, if I'm blasting my music, I would not hear it or is it? Correct. Yeah. If you were blasting your music, you probably wouldn't hear it, but, um, um, but you would, you'd likely hear the warbling. Probably the best thing to do would be to contact your clinician and, and go in to the okay. clinic and they can, they can, they can kind of simulate the, the charging um, and you could, you could hear it kind of firsthand. That's probably going to be the most effective way. All right. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you bet. And Steve, I know you wanted, um, um, you had a, a, a minor correction to the ERI comment. Indeed, sure. And I was just thinking of, uh, you know, the multiple generations of the device. So, so we've 90 days on our latest uh, emblem device. Once you hit that ERI point, again, equivalent to the 0%, it's uh, 90 days, uh, six, six charges or shocks, if you will. your clinician again will notify you when you are at that ERI. And can you provide more information on the test in and test out EKG parameters? Steve, do you want to tackle that one or are you comfortable tackling that one? Yeah, Thanks. certainly. Uh, you know, as, as Sharon mentioned on one of the previous slides, there's there's a so-called what we refer to as a screening process with regard to the SICD. So what we're doing there is basically analyzing your heart's signals for the compatibility with this subcutaneous system. So with the prior question about uh, the, the Timothy syndrome, syndrome, you've got the, the long QT interval, perhaps there's an elevated T wave. The, the programmer unit <clears throat> actually monitors the, the signals on your chest using surface electrodes. So they're placed in a strategic location so we can monitor your heart signals and it evaluates those signals in three different views. And generally speaking, in terms of the more information part, you know, we're looking at characteristics like signal amplitude, like the, the height, the tallness, if you will, of, of your particular R waves within your rhythm. We're looking at that, that potential T wave component that might be there. We're doing some ratio comparisons. So there's a lot of thinking going on with the system when we analyze that particular signal. Um, and it, it's computing all of that and ultimately um, assisting your clinician to see if this is a signal that looks um, compatible with with the SICD system, or is there perhaps some alternative technology that should be uh, considered? Um, but again, it's it's part of the overall process. Um, it it uh, does all this analysis, provides that information to the clinician, so that both of you can determine uh, what technology is uh, is best given your um, heart rate uh, and morphology. Okay, so um, I just figured I'd chime in here and ask this. Um, I'm the one who posed that question, so. Um, my, it, it, a normal EKG would not be exclusion. I guess that's primarily my question. Um, my daughter has CPVT. So unless she's about to have an event, she's pretty normal, undetected. So 
Yeah, in, indeed, and and clearly there are patients with uh, with CBVT with with SICD, and um, you know, I'm not a doctor, so you know there is a little bit of awareness in terms of some activity that may happen, um, you know, even uh, potentially uh, uh, post shock, if you will, and, and some polymorphic activity that that can occur in the sort. But but the note is is that it's probably less to do with the polymorphic activity and more to do with you know what does that signal um, look like at rest, and and are we um, seeing the R wave when we want to see the R wave and, and not necessarily doing so-called double counting with the T wave. And again, we've, we've got a process uh, in, in place with that uh, screening tool to do that. Um, and with CPVT, you know, perhaps there's a situation where one's discussing with their clinician saying, you know, do I, do I want to review uh, what's, what's going on here, perhaps at an elevated uh, rate uh, at, uh, under safe conditions as a consideration there. Um, but, but again, there's a process in place to analyze uh, that patient signal. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Hey, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to interact, interject here. Going back to the previous one on charging, uh, Jeff, I did confirm that the the automatic cap reform, which is not delivering a shock, it will not beep. So it's only going to do the sounds when there's going to be a ther therapy delivery. So um, I just confirmed that here. So thank you. Thank you. That's that's even better news. And I know that on here tonight, we have some patients or family members that have ICDs and some that have it, the, well, that have the traditional ICDs and some that have the SICD. And so just to clarify for everybody on the um, length of the battery for each of the two types, I think there might've been a little bit of confusion about that. So the battery length we have to be for the class right now. And um, we are, um, what we're seeing with the newest generation, the emblem uh, and emblem MRI that are not under advisory, that are, um, is uh, about 8.7 years is what it's looking like. So even though our labeling says seven years, we're seeing, it's looking like they're going to last longer. Um, whereas with the transvenous ICD, um, this one is gonna be a range. It depends which manufacturer's device you have. And, also, how much pacing you're requiring, but um, they are at they're on average, I would say, ten to twelve years. So, and maybe even a little bit longer, depending on the you know the manufacturer. Boston really um, is pretty um, known for having um, really good long-lasting transvenous ICD batteries. I guess uh, the only other thing I'd offer, think Sharon, is that. Um, for some patients, they have what's called cardiac resynchronization devices, and I don't know that anyone in this audience should have those, but they're delivering a lot of pacing over their lifetime to help with heart failure. And those devices have a longevity kind of more consistent with emblems, so they'd be, you know, kind of around eight years. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, let's see. What all can the device record? Um, this is from Sherry, and I'm going to... Um, are you talking about the events that it would record and how many? Feel free to jump in here. I'm just not sure what you're referring to. Um, yes, she is. So, um, boy, Steve, I'm going to have you look in your manual there. I cannot remember how many um, how many events uh, the SICD can store. Um, so. Yeah. Sure, no problem. So we have uh, quite a bit of storage space, if you will, um, and we have many different types of episodes as well. So if a patient actually uh, receives therapy, we refer to that as a treated episode, if you will. Uh, so we have capability to record those treated episodes. At times, you may have a situation where the device thinks, hey, this patient may potentially require therapy, but we spontaneously convert. Okay, so no therapy is required. We have untreated episodes, and we can store those as well. Uh, part of the audience, perhaps, uh, maybe we have AF uh, present. Okay, so the, the device can look at uh, um, unusual intervals that are occurring and, and determine that the patient may be experiencing some AF um, atrial fibrillation. So we have uh, capability to, to store that uh, as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, those are the, the primary types of, uh, of episodes that are stored within their device. There's a couple of their diagnostic related uh, considerations, but we have you know, like 45 different slots, if you will, available to store all those episodes. So, um, you know, there's a very strong likelihood that if, if your device does experience an episode, that'll be available for the clinician to review at your in-person follow-up or via the remote transmission with Latitude. 
the last question. Do you have a question? Oh, you were talking about the pacemaker that the question is when will they be available in Canada? So just um, I'll clarify for everybody, they're not available anywhere in the world yet because they're still um, in that process of going through FDA approval. Um, and then before that would even happen, the study has to be completed and it just started. So it's gonna be a while, um, you know, by a while, I mean, several years. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the emblem devices being implanted today will be compatible with the Empower pacemaker. So hopefully that answers the question. All right, well, I know we've gone a little bit over. And so I'm gonna, I don't see any more questions. Marsha, I'm gonna shoot it back to you. Yes, I just wanna thank you. And I, I thank Adrian of LifeSure AED Solutions and Sharon, Kurt and Steve of Boston Scientific for volunteering tonight and addressing all of these questions. And I wanna thank all of our families and a few healthcare professionals that are listening in tonight for all your great questions posted. I'm Marcia Baker and I'm the program director for SADS. And I wanna remind you uh, to watch our emails and our social posts for September's upcoming webinars. We have, I believe four scheduled. So check those out. So I wish everyone a good evening and thank you for joining us tonight.